Hello, everyone. Welcome to another edition of the Orthodox Nationalist. Today is the 12th of February, 2020. I am Matthew Raphael Johnson. And um, I have to ask the assistance of my listeners. Um, I'm already a year behind on my property taxes. It's, it's been a battle. Um, I'm in some trouble in this respect. It's, um, you know, it's difficult for me, but, but I ask whatever assistance you can, you can give. I, I have health insurance again. Thank God for this. And you guys have been, um, uh, very generous in, in keeping me afloat. Cause as you all know, uh, this is a full time job. And, um, for all of you who have, um, Contributed, I want to say a, a, a thank you. Um, and I ask those who have not to at least consider it. Today I want to talk about something that has been important to me for a very long time. Very few people in the nationalist, uh, uh, royalist community really talk about it. And that's the idea of corporatism or syndicalism. And that this is the economic basis of social nationalism and, and monarchy, and certainly an orthodox monarchy. This is a way that the Middle Ages can be brought um, into our postmodern world in a rational and intelligent way. Nationalism is far stronger in economics than it normally gets, gets credit for. National socialism in all of its different forms is one of the highest manifestations of nationalism in this in this the European royalists, and even the third world post-colonial varieties. The economic expression of the family is corporatism. Nationalism starts, stems from two things. The family, first of all, and the larger community that grows out of it. It doesn't make any sense without them. And when I say the family, I mean the extended family. Other George Titov, who's one of the priests of the Union of the Russian People, the Black Hundreds, has argued in his 2007 article that corporatism is a basis for orthodox monarchy, that, of course, capitalism and Marxism are, are two sides of the same coin, as most of you already know. But monarchy isn't just a devotion to the religiously based king or ceremonial pomp, but it's a complete philosophy of politics and economics. Modern royalists, who are all nationalists, of course, people like M.V. Nazarov, one of my favorites, M.B. Smolin, M.V. Boldrev, Vladimir Katapets, have all argued that corporatism is critical to understanding monarchy and nationalism today. A corporation refers to a functional unit. This is a class within the social body. This is the original definition of the word class. So when I usually write it out, I write corporate or corporation with a capital C to distinguish it from the way we normally use the term. A corporation represents socially necessary elements of a society. A simple way to understand this is the fivefold model, which I generally accept. The, the primary sector with agriculture, the secondary, which is industry, the tertiary, which is Services, uh, retail, transportation, distribution, media, tourism, insurance, etc. The fourth level is the intellectual work, uh, government, culture, library, scientific research, education, information technology, and all the rest of it. That's about, you know, 6% of the American population. And finally, the quinary sector, the fifth level, is sometimes uh, included as, as a leadership level the highest levels of decision-making in any, in any society, people who have established themselves. And, of course, things like, you know, home care also have to be included here. Each one of these sectors, of course, has subsectors. And the broader sector is represented by a corporation, and some of the subsectors are as well. And this is the classic model. It, it, it provides standards for quality work, establishes basic practices, it provides benefits, education, 
and of course also acts as a labor union. The great theorist of this is George William Frederick Hegel. As you know, he's been one of my favorites since I was a teenager. And he advocated that these be represented in the upper house of, of any kind of parliament. Of course, they're all equal to one another. They can't function one without the other. Um, Hegel says in his section uh, 251, 252 of the Philosophy of Right, 1831, he says, the labor organization of civil society is split in accordance with the nature of its particular into different branches. The implicit likeness of such particulars to one another becomes readily existent in an association, which is something common to its members. In accordance with the definition of its function, a corporation has the right, under the surveillance of the public authority, A, to look after its, uh, its own interests, B, co-op members qualified objectively by their necessary skill and rectitude, C, to protect its members against contingencies, and D, to provide the education requisite to fit others to become members. Then Hegel says, its right is to come on the scene as a second family for its members. Now, he says that this is not for day laborers. This is for skilled workers. It's for anyone with a technique that can be improved over time. Hegel is very concerned with identity. Being a member of a corporation makes you a somebody and actually uses that that word in section 253. He says, it's also recognized that he belongs to a whole which is itself an organ of the entire society and he is actively concerned in promoting the comparatively disinterested end of this whole. Thus, he commands the respect due to one in his social position. Now, I mentioned contingency, and what he's talking about is the market. It's a guard against poverty, against the ups and downs, the boom and bust cycle. He says, the wealthy perform their duty to their fellow associates, that is to say, in corporation. And thus riches cease to inspire either pride or envy, pride in their owners, envy in others. In these conditions, rectitude obtains the proper recognition and respect. So in other words, while well, the corporation internally is hierarchic, the better off has to assist all members. Personal pride is in membership, not in money. Social status is corporate-based. The problem for Hegel is riches, money, or these are often arbitrary. Of all the billionaires and, and, and high-level millionaires, how many of them actually work for this? How many rather gain this through inheritance or luck and playing the stock market like it would be a roulette wheel? The corporation limits the random element in the granting of, of wealth and privilege. Um, because it's, he says, elevated to conscious effort for a common end. So differences in wealth force the growth of the country. Hegel's theory and part of my master's thesis in St. Louis was on this. You know, Adam Smith had the notion of the invisible hand. Utilitarian, he was utilitarian and in society. Individuals, in his mind, just want to become wealthy. They want to become powerful that way. But they realize over time, the only way to do that is to make people around them happy. If they want to become wealthy, if they really want to seek after their self-interest, they have to provide a good or a service that helps people. They have to be nice to people. They have to care for the customer, or if, because they don't, someone else will. Hegel accepts that only to an extent, because it doesn't get away from the individual. In his case, what happens isn't so much that there's this invisible hand where someone has to work for the for the entirety. There really isn't an entirety. It's just you know, building a market. For Hegel, civil society is sort of the individual, you know, realm of the economy. It can't last because in civil society, in the capitalist world, the market, you end up having wealthy people who control everything, who corner the market, who begin creating the market rather than responding to it. Skilled workers begin to realize that they're not really working for themselves after all. That in order for their labor to matter, the labor of everyone else matters. So if they're working in industry, they come to realize that, well, they have to eat too. So agriculture is just as important. If they're in law enforcement, 
they begin to realize that their job only functions if people are um, moral, if they're taxpayers to pay their salary. We begin to realize that everything is connected. Self-seeking doesn't lead to the invisible hand, but a different realization. The social body is real. It's not an invention. It's real and more significant than they are. The social whole comes before the parts. The drive for profit isn't enough to make any social sense out of, out of labor. It has to have a public presence. But he also says, the corporate, I'm quoting him now, section 255, corporations must fall under the higher surveillance of the state because otherwise they would ossify and build themselves and decline into a miserable caste. In and by itself, however, a corporation is not a closed caste. Its purpose is rather to bring an isolated trade into the social order and elevate it to a sphere where it gains strength and respect. So the unity of the nation, the individuality of the corporation. The individual by himself is worthless. He would be crushed by by uh, forces far more powerful than, than him. A corporation, however, is powerful enough that that can't be the case. But at some point, everyone comes to the realization that their work is only possible because other people work too. That their field can only function if other fields function at the same level of quality. That we're all dependent. We're all dependent in a very specific way. And we're bound together in this unity. That's where, in a formal sense, in Hegel's world, where the nation comes from. The two things have to be in balance. Corporate representation on the one hand, and the national whole on the other. St. Philaret of Moscow is one of the great political theorists of the Russian Orthodox tradition in the 19th century. He says, what is the state? It's a specific part of the universal dominion of the Almighty, separated by function, but held together spiritually, coupled with the unity of the whole. Now notice, he says separated by function, as a direct reference to a corporation. It's the nature of economic justice, just as much as it's the nature of the state. It's an organization based on a specific social function serving an objective need. So any social phenomenon is part of a single whole or moral universe in which it makes sense. He asks the question again. He says, what is the state? A union of free moral beings who join together through the donation of a part of their freedom for the protection and affirmation of the common forces of the moral law, which constitute the, necessary, uh, the necessity of their being. Civil laws are nothing more than the interpretations of this law and its boundaries applied to special cases, set against its violation. Where the sacred law of morality is firmly established in our hearts by education, faith, sound, undistorted teaching, and respected examples of our ancestors. We remain faithful to our fatherland. When it comes under attack, we sacrifice ourselves for it without the desire for glory. There, we die for the law. While we do not fear to die for the law, we rather obey it than save our own selves. If the law that dwells in our hearts is expelled by false enlightenment or unrestrained sensuality, then written laws command no respect. Lawful commands are ignored, self-will leads to oppression, and soon society comes to its final end. And it's significant that that's taken from his speech called On the Causes of Our Success in the War of 1812. And of course, he's referring to natural law, and he's referring to a fatherland, a nation, a unity. So if you're ever worried about orthodoxy and nationalism, well, St. Philaret couldn't have been clearer to die for the fatherland, and he was certainly willing to do so. The great nationalists in the Orthodox world, whether it be the Department of Anastasi, St. John of Kronstadt, Seraphim of Surav, um, all the great Russian saints of the late 19th and early 20th century. Then you have those outside of Russia. Um, Othmar Spahn, one of, the, one of the great Austrian Christian socialists, which is an early national socialist group. He says this, and this is actually quoted from the Russian translation in Tithaus' article. And he's talking about he's talking about liberalism. He says, for this theory, the individual is not something in himself and for himself. Um, I'm sorry, he's not thinking of liberalism here. He's thinking of anti-liberalism here. For this theory, the individual is not something in himself and for himself. But in his essence and concept, he's thinkable only in community, that is, in connection with others. Therefore, society can't be obtained by just adding individuals, like a bunch of stones, 
but the individual is initially a member of society. Therefore, the individual's attitude to society is not external, utilitarian and instrumental, but spiritual and moral. You know, economics comes into being as a so-called social science, really to justify the rule of money after the British Revolution and the, the empire that it helped create. It begins with the abstract market, or even worse, with the equally abstract consumer. The social sciences can't envision culture, nations, or traditions. They're not quantitative elements. Now, the term corporatism is used today, but not in its proper way. The Anglo-American academic establishment is threatened by the old corporatist model, and so it wants to destroy it by redefining it. And it redefines it just as one interest group among many. The term corporatism is kind of all over the place in political science, but it is deliberately misdefined. When the system wants to manipulate with words, which is really all it does, they then force one term to cover something completely different, even opposite of what it's supposed to be. Um, the term, the, the work, so actually a, a volume, Social Corporatism, a Superior Economic System. It's edited by, um, uh, Yuka Pekarin. I think they're, um, from Finland. No one could pronounce those names. In 1992. And they're, they're redefining the term. In the introduction, it's defined this way. We shall call here an economy corporatist if its wage bargaining structure is centralized, if workers and employers are organized into a few powerful national federations negotiating wages and other terms of employment on behalf of its members, and if, in addition, the government is prepared to share some political space with these organizations. That is not corporatism. It, it might be an indirect secondary effect of it. That's certainly not what it is. The closest secular definition I've come across um, is in the, of all places, the Australian Journal of Chinese Affairs um, in 1995. And they write, Corporatism is an ideal system. At the national level, the state recognizes one and only organization as the sole representative of a sectoral interest of individuals, enterprises, or institutions that comprise the organization's assigned constituency. The state determines which organizations will be recognized. Um, the associations sometimes get channeled into the policymaking process and often help implement state policy on the government's behalf. Corporatism involves more than just a working relationship between the state and associations. An actively interventionist state also helps organize relations between the various sectoral organizations. It bases its intervention as a grand arbiter or mediator on the premise that the government is a guardian of the common good of a national interest that supersedes the parochial interest of each sector. The state does not attempt to dominate it directly. It leaves some degree of autonomy. Now, that's different from what you would normally hear as a definition of corporatism. Stripped down to its most formal essentials, that's pretty much a tolerable definition. The corporation acts both as a representative body for different social sectors of socially necessary labor, as well as acting as a check on both the power of the state and capital. The corporation is an absolute necessity for any kind of representative government to even begin to function. Corporatism has a long history. You've heard me say here before that China is a national socialist state, and I mean it. It's a Han nationalist corporatist state. Um, one author, uh, Unger, and, and a few others say this, talking about, you know, what kind of but what China has become over the last 35 years. During the 1980s, as the Chinese state moved further to free up the economy and to relax direct party control over society, it needed additional mechanisms to bridge the gap in control thereby created. Thus, in addition to the proto-corporatist organizations of the command economy era, a large number of new associations were created to serve as corporatist intermediaries and agents. As of 1993, 1,400 national associations had been approved by the government. Almost 20,000 associations and branch organizations were registered with provincial authorities, and more than 160,000 were registered at the county level. These range in nature from science and technology associations to organization of different economic sectors, cultural things, health, sports, social welfare, public affairs, etc. And the author goes on to say that this structure is very similar to that of Taiwan during the 60s and 70s, a very similar structure to South Korea during its takeoff period. Clearly, 
we're seeing a pattern here. These are all very successful societies. And every one is based on racial nationalism and uh, a homogenous cultural world. And that these seem to be necessary for this development to work. China, Korea, Taiwan exploded economically under the corporate system. Hitler's Germany, Franco's Spain, the same thing. In China, they're called democratic parties. These are the corporations. They're assigned to recruit from a functional entity, intellectuals, technocrats, whatever it is. And it ensures that development is not for personal profit. And it's worked to such an extent that the U.S. wants to declare war on the system. Not when Mao was slaughtering people. No, the corporatist system, that is where we're going to draw the line. Hong Kong is one of the most purely corporatist systems out there. It has an executive council. It's a chief policy-making body. It's elected from a 1,500-member college that itself draws members from industry, labor, agriculture, medicine, education, legal, engineering, real estate, etc. Out of a population of 7 million. 1,500 members, 7 million. It's one of the most representative systems possible today. The interest groups are called functional constituencies. And basing a government on them guarantees representation. The pro- protests that have paralyzed the area are protests against an extremely representative system. The legislature, about half the bodies elected by the citizens at large, the rest come from these citizens as functional constituencies. 40 of the 70 legislative council seats are directly elected by the majority. The rest um, are le- elected by functional, functional constituencies. Um, and this is, this is a, a highly representative system. In interwar Romania, the political theorist, uh, Mihail Melonescu is someone that I don't think pretty much anyone is talking about. He is one of the economists of, uh, national socialism at the time and worked both for the Iron Guard state as well as, uh, Antonescu. He calls the corporation a collective and public organization composed of all persons, who together fill the same function in the nation. Its purpose is to assure the exercise of this function in the supreme interest of the nation by means of rules and rights imposed on its members. So these corporations are based on functional differentiation. And they're beyond, he's an economist, but it goes beyond economics. Any other national function, he says, such as those pertaining to religion, education, cultural, etc., would also create distinct corporations. They're not pressure groups. They're public institutions serving a national interest. Monolescu wrote that corporations were comprehensive. He says, the network of corporations covers the whole nation and leaves not one single individual national activity untouched that is not organized into a corporation. And by activity, he's talking about a field that is necessary, important, great social significance that requires discipline and uh, concentrated action. And his theory, which was to some extent put into place by Antonescu, these are semi-independent organizations and they have kind of voluntary agreements with each other and the state to ensure basic mutual social harmony. They select their own representatives that would combine at the top in a national parliament. Each corporation's numerical weight in this assembly would be based upon the importance of its function. The corporatist ideal integrates individuals into occupational and functional units the point being to reduce class conflict, alienation, everything that Hegel said. You know, Hegel is so difficult. Um, Americans and Englishmen have such trouble with him that the, he's, he's completely misunderstood. In, in Europe, it's a little different. In Russia and Romania, he's far more popular. And this is, in, in Manolescu's idea, this is how small states, you know, uh, we say third world states, uh, agricultural states, can create balanced modernization. It worked in Asia. He's talking about um, the relief that, that people will feel being integrated into this corporation and eliminating internal disputes at a time of national danger. And Manolescu had written that the poor agrarian states like Romania at the time, you know, Italy, Spain, Portugal in the 20s, these are condemned to permanent poverty unless they close themselves off from the world capitalist market. He was a theorist of autarky. Um, his theory 
is the foundation of what we call dependency. Um, the nationalism and corporatism are really the same thing, because corporations have to be organized into a unity. And his economic theory is now taken for granted quite often, and he was one of the first to say it, that free trade is a disaster for small um, agricultural societies. Because if, let's say, Romania is exporting unfinished goods, say raw materials, and is importing finished goods from Great Britain or Germany, that country then is doomed to have its wealth flow out of the country into these more powerful organizations, into these more powerful states. This is why egocentrism is such a, a, a rotten thing, especially for the poor countries of the world. They have to close themselves off from at least the rich. Unless they put tariffs up against finished goods from the powerful economies, they're doomed. Um, they're absolutely doomed. And this is why authoritarian military governments in East Asia were extremely successful. Um, they targeted investment, they focused on a few very important things, and they organized corporations to target public money into these sectors that were very important to them. Uh, in the Third Reich, Hitler's reconstruction in the 30s was a corporate thing. Ultimately, and this is from de Grel's, uh book in the matter, five institutions organized representative uh, and represented labor. Um, the councils of trust and the labor commissions are the first two. Uh, the council of trust were empowered by the state to equalize bargaining power of labor with capital. Council of trust was a long-term cooperation of interest. The labor commissions were arbitration boards under state control, at least in Germany's case, that were neutral between the two sets of interests. The third, they relied on this um, consultative council of experts, which brought the corporate membership in various fields to make sense out of technical matters, because um, some of this stuff is often very difficult. And if all else failed, the fourth would be the court of honor, the final judge. Um, all told, these are... Um, this is what built socially Germany in the 1930s. And of course, the fifth being um, the unions themselves. Uh, or you can even say the state for that matter. Four major ones, and then labor itself. And the success is overwhelming. In creating these corporate bodies, it's not the state, it's not capital, it's not labor. It's separate from all of this. Um, and really, I should, I should say really the fifth body, I said there are five, the fifth is a national labor service, which brings all classes together. So you have rich people and poor people doing work in the fields together. That was extremely important. But these five things were all corporations. They're not, it, it's semi-corporatist. They're not organized by function. They're organized by uh, function at least in a, in a purely public sense, not in a trade union sense. We know what happened. German living standards rose like no other state in history. You're talking between 33 and 38. A minimum. Weekly net earnings rise by, rose by 22%, but the cost of living barely moved. Even after the war started, income started continued to rise. By 1943, the average hourly earnings of the German worker had risen by 25%, weekly earnings by 41%. And that's a statistic from a Jewish author, Sonbaum, from 1980. Um, I mean, during the Third Reich's peacetime years, um, even they food consumption, wine consumption, champagne consumption increased 500%. Tourism. Importantly, automobile ownership during the 30s went up 300%. From all manufacturers, manufacturing, automotives uh, doubled from 1932 to 37. And our exports went up 800%. And of course, on the corporate side, the net profits of large corporations quadrupled. And managerial and entrepreneurial income rose by nearly 50%. That wasn't just big business, also small business. 11% um, a year was a GDP growth. 
with no significant inf uh, increase in the rate of inflation, which is very rare. In the three years, between 39 and 42, German industry expanded as much as it had during the preceding 50 years. All of these are various versions of the corporatist system, both in theory and in practice. These are bodies that are not state, they're not capital, they're not purely labor. They're of a different order altogether. A corporation represents a functional unit or even an aspect of society, as in Hitler's case, that's extremely important socially, that's not purely labor-oriented, not capital-oriented, not government-oriented. But when you consider what's necessary for any society to function, those elements have their own corporations and they cooperate for the common good. Corporatism, nationalism, national socialism, royalism, all are based on the notion of the common good, not the individual good. Corporatism transfers the center of human aspirations outside the person. But the corporations have to have something in common. The national ideal, which is almost always a religious ideal. You know, the, the ethnic nationalism always has a religious element. You know, the, the you know, Arabs have Islam, the, the, um, the Chinese have, have Confucianism and, and Buddhism, which I don't think are religions, but you get the idea. Uh, Russians have orthodoxy, Poles have Catholicism. It's very hard to refer to an ethnic group without a religious group automatically attached to it. But, as I've said many times, the individual, in the sense that liberals use it, and broadly speaking, that's what liberalism is, it's not possible because the individual is a creation of society, starting with the family. Therefore, it can't be the creator of it. Again, St. Philip of Moscow says this, where there is human society, there must be a power connecting people to it. For without power, it's possible to imagine only unsettled multitudes of people, not a real society. But power acts in society and preserves it by means of obedience. Consequently, obedience must be combined with the existence of social life. Anyone seeking to weaken obedience would weaken the foundation of society. And what he means here is that the individual is, is, is an atom. It's not a person. Individualism of humanism is it's self-affirming. It's a depleted element of humanity. It's too simple. It's too uniform. What St. Philip is talking about is the person, not the individual. And a person is created by his social function, but that social function only makes sense within a broader unity. The concept of the whole, the integrity, it applies to both human community and the human person. It's one of two things. Either you are guided by passion, the self-seeking motive, or by reason, which is communal by its very definition. There's reason and there's logic. The determining principle of the whole is the consistency of all of its elements, guided by a single idea. So the single most important property of the whole is its very structure, is its hierarchy. In public life, the meaning is always present. Every ethnic group has an idea has a principle that creates it and all elements of society manifest it in one way or another. Without it, there is no society by definition. A society has to exist for a reason. The essence of society for Hegel, for, for St. Philip, for all these people, isn't for an exchange of services, as the Anglo-American world seems to think, not for satisfying desire or passion, but serving the values that underlie association. Even though they, of course, they, they satisfy concrete needs, it's an idea. If you reduce society to simply satisfying physical needs, that only begs the question. Why should we even bother to do that? What's so good about humanity in the first place? What difference would it make? Why would I work my fingers to the bone for a society? I don't even know why it exists. Why should I care? Why, why am I even a part of this? What's its overall purpose? You're going to send me off to war and not tell me why? What am I going to die for? No one dies for abstractions. Individualism is opposed to those truly organic communities into which a man enters out of necessity. They only seem external. A law to be a true law isn't a limitation on a person. It creates the person. 
Selfhood is unthinkable outside of these relationships. Of course, if these connections are unhealthy, the self is unhealthy. Life takes on meaning when the center of gravity is outside the self, and the citizen becomes an organ of the superpersonal being. They become organs of the social body. Now, a specific person has many definitions. You could be a member of a certain, a certain nation, you're also a worker, member of a corporation, member of a city, you're a family man, you're in a certain county, you're know, rural, urban, whatever it might be. But all of those elements have to have something in common. They can't be random or else you'll end up schizophrenic. This system can't be totally unitary. That's, that's never happened. That's impossible. It is possible, though, for these, these functions to simply fall apart because they have no internal core. Mental illnesses are social problems. This is the origin of things like schizophrenia. Social functions that have no unifying factor. Modernism has to create this notion that mental illness is about chemical imbalances, or else they'd be condemning themselves. Only one of two values can rule. Either the rational and spiritual that unites people into a wide world, or the arrogant hedonism of the post-Christian world in the West. One of two options is possible. Nazarov, one of my favorite um, royalists writing in Russia, a member of the uh, the Black Hundreds, Union of the Russian People, and probably their chief theorist, in 2007, he quotes Ibn Ilin, who of course dealt with, with this issue many times. He says, The state is not a mechanism of competing self-interest, but the organism of fraternal service, unity of faith, honor, and sacrifice. This is a historical and political basis of Russia. Russia has become, I've regretted it, Russia will return to its roots again. Fascism does not give us a new idea, but only attempts in its own way to implement this Christian Russian national idea in relation to its conditions. So many of the Russian immigration before the war looked very, very honestly towards fascism as a way to rebuild Russia. But Russia has its own corporate idea. The old Russian Zemensky Sobor, or, or, or Sobori in plural, or Zaborism Lee, um, which played a huge role in Russian history. And that Sobor, that, that collegiality, brings together the different functions and units of society into dialogue. The dialogue has to be in a language that has much in common. Justice and ecclesiology are united because this is how the church functions. The first task of the healthy state is to know this central value, the idea which unifies everybody, what all these functional groups have in common, and strengthen that union. But that requires that this idea be well um, described and understood and explicated. Now, that's the job of political theory that exists in the national level, in the corporate level. Political philosophy is different. That's what all nations have in common the nature of the common good and natural law. One is more fundamental than the other. The highest unit expresses and implements its highest value, then the structural elements are all necessary links in this hierarchy. Each corporation expresses the unity in an incomplete way. Um, so integralism, and you've heard that phrase before, it's really the same concept. It's a hierarchy of communities expressing one value in different ways in different fields. That's the only way that a civic power can satisfactorily fulfill its main function. It's unity and diversity in the true sense of the word. It's a community of communities based on hierarchy. The corpus state is an organized national economy where there is no randomness. There is no spontaneous organization because there is no such entity. Things are done according to the goals and ideals that animate that society. They're expressed in these communities. The corporate system isn't just an organized economy, but an organized life. It doesn't come from without. This is an aspect of the human person. The individual and market relationships can't function for very long. It becomes an oligarchy very, very quickly. The new martyr, um, John Wiskodov, who um, is, one of the, is one of the greatest political theorists of the, the Soviet era, um, and of course murdered by them, 
he says this, and this is I'm, I'm translating this from uh, Tito's uh, paper from 2019. Saint John says the obligation to use our income not only for our own interests but also in the interest of the general well-being is a purely moral obligation imposed on us by love of our neighbor. God created wealth inequality to enable people to help their fellow men and thus indicated a pure source of this wonderful and noble impulse. The material well-being of the worker and his family depends on the height of wages, sorry, the level of wages, subject to constant fluctuations due to fluctuations in the market and retail prices. Labor prices then are turned into a commodity and its value is reduced to the last degree. Free competition, unlimited power of capital. These are the reasons that cause this phenomenon, this uh, fluctuation. Liberal and radical parties indicate various means to alleviate the plight of the workers, but they can't solve this great problem of our time and protect the working masses from decline and decay. The reason for this situation of the working class and the disasters resulting from, uh, from it lie in the falling away of society from Christianity with its covenants of love and selflessness. Now, many of our people have said a thousand times, the fundamental notion that the great weakness of the left when it used to actually care about the working class and, and economics, um, is that labor looking for a bigger piece of the pie, or even to have some control over over investment, or whatever whatever the socialist notion was in the, in the in the materialist world, was never good enough. No one's going to die to make another five dollars an hour. No one's going to die because they hate their boss. That's not enough. That's purely negative. Now, of course, today, the left substitutes gender and, and non-white races um, for for class. They used to care about labor, now they care about that. The only people today who actually give a damn about the working class are nationalists and corporatists today. We're the only ones taking this seriously. Liberal democracy is class democracy, class in the, in the newer sense of the, of the word. The corporation is that one entity because it's not only economic but also spiritual and ethnic that brings about social harmony. The left today does not talk about the working class as such. There's way too many white people for that. What Marxism used to mean by class or the proletariat or the working man, they now substitute non-whites, women, lesbians, whatever it is, in its place. That's really all they care about now. In other words, they've made their peace with oligarchy. Um, you see this in uh, you know, Leo XIII, his famous encyclical, Rerum Novarum. Um, the Christianity, both East and West, have talked about the, the necessity of these spiritual trade unions. Uh, the working class is a relatively new phenomenon. The proletariat um, is a fairly new thing. Um, and the church, both East and West, have been forced to answer this. And in both cases, the corporation was, um, was the answer. The proletariat is a new social unit. Uh, people from the countryside, deformed by urbanization, still require their appropriate form of organization. Today, our corrupt society began the British Revolution of 1688 and, of course, the French Revolution of 1789. It's an oligarchy. The lauded system of abstract rights for equally abstract citizens doesn't impose any obligations on anyone, except they, you know, pay taxes and not murder anybody. But a society dedicated to justice, the principle is, to whom much has been given, much will be expected. Class in the true sense, I mean, class and function are the same thing. This is as much a set of obligations as anything else. The egoistic imperative is, is the most anti-Christian thing imaginable. Liberalism cannot talk about community by definition. Now, the opposite of justice is the privatization of profit and the externalization of cost. That is exploitation. That is the definition. Economics and law as academic disciplines are just extensions or projections of their own pathology. The assumption that all academics, all scholars and sociologists, the assumption that they start with is that all people are egocentric and that egocentrism means that they want all the money and power they can get while at the same time minimizing all obligations and consequences. But this is not the case. Or if it is, this is the very nature of sin. 
Many of you know Hilary Belloc, one of the great books of our civilization, The Servile State, uh, the 1912 edition is what I, I'm looking at. And he describes in a brilliant sector, section, the medieval conception of politics. And he says this, The medieval state was an agglomeration of families of varying wealth, but by far the greater number of owners, but greater number of owners of the means of production. It was an agglomeration in which the stability of this distributive system, if I've called, as I've called it, was guaranteed by the existence of cooperative bo- bodies binding men of the same craft or the same village together, guaranteeing the small proprietor against loss of his economic independence, while at the same time it guarantees society against the growth of the proletariat. If liberty of purchase and of sale, of mortgage inheritance was restricted, it was restricted with the social object of preventing the growth of an economic oligarchy which could exploit the rest of the community. It restrains upon liberty where restraints designed for the preservation of liberty. It's preservation, and every action of medieval society from the flower of the Middle Ages to the approach of their catastrophe, was directed towards the establishment of a state in which men could economically be free of the possession of capital and of land. So what he means is, these aren't really restrictions. These are restrictions only to the naked sinful ego. It is actually part of the construction of the person. Remember, a person and an individual are two very different things. But this has been the medieval idea wherever it's developed. Belloc makes the argument that it failed in Britain due to the actions of Henry VIII. When he, uh, in in, in Belloc's argument, when he um, confiscated the monastery lands, he didn't keep it. This is how he bought supporters. He gave it out to his friends. So you have this group of people that suddenly came into this great landed wealth, connected to the crown, and of course that money, they soon turned against the crown. Because property rejects all limits and breaks all bonds. So by the time Henry died, an oligarchy of great proprietors developed. And Belloc mentions the new families, uh, the Howards, the Cavendishes, the Cecils, the Russells, and 50 new families, he says, had arisen and dominated the legislature. The War of the Roses had decimated the aristocracy, permitting the London, uh, the London oligarchy and the new gentry to control the cash the crown needed to function. That became parliament. That became modern liberal democracy. Because the theory of modern liberal democracy cannot be separated from the war of Charles against Parliament in this very same era. In Russia, it was different. It was Ivan III and most certainly Ivan IV that crushed these families before they could take over completely. That was reversed in the 18th century, as we've talked about at some length on this show. But thank God that was put into check uh, in most of the 19th. Because this is what monarchy is capable to do, uh, of doing. I've been saying for many years in Byzantium, it was the work of Emperor Basil II that broke the oligarchy in the Greek lands. Uh, in Syria in the 20th century, it was a Ba'ath party under General Hafez al-Assad who broke the back of the oligarchy in the countryside. Um, but the British Empire was built by these oligarchical families and promoted the ideological interests that we deal with today. The notion of capitalism, the dominion of the mercantile interests over everything else. That's one interest. It's a legitimate interest, of course. But it's one among many. Capitalism demands that the social whole believe everything revolves around mercantile interests and profit-seeking. The only thing that really matters is the flair for tricking other, other people out of money. That's the route to power and prestige. Money stands for education, manners, obligation. It redefines rights. It does away with justice. The market rules everything. But it is not, as many will tell you, this democratic vote with your dollar. It's quite the contrary. It's an organized system of consumption where, over time, conglomerates create demand rather than responding to it. Great Russian philosopher, uh, uh, Pavel Florensky, he says, The political freedom of the masses in states with representative government is their self-deception, a dangerous self-deception distracting from useful activities. It must be firmly said that politics is a specialty that is as inaccessible to the masses as medicine or mathematics, and therefore as dangerous in the hands of the ignorant as poison or explosives. Let me me repeat that statement. It must be firmly said that politics is a specialty that is as inaccessible to the masses as medicine or mathematics, and therefore as dangerous in the hands of the ignorant as poison or explosives. 
Anyway, continuing, the corresponding conclusion about representation follows from this. As a democratic principle, it's harmful, and not satisfying anyone in particular, at the same time relaxes the whole. Not a single government, if it doesn't want to collapse, actually relies on the decision of the majority in matters of major importance and makes its own adjustments, which means that in essence it does not recognize representation, it only uses it. Now we all know what this means. Today, the word democratic just means liberal. Um, during the British Revolution, Parliament, the oligarchy in Parliament referred to themselves as the will of the people. It was almost a mystic connection that they created. Um, now, he re- he's referring to politics as inaccessible. He's not talking about power. He's talking about the discipline itself. Let me, let me say something very important here. Um, ignorant people think that political science is about current events. See, today, it's journalists, not historians or political scientists, that decide what issues are important. And it's journalists who prepackage all of these issues that have their arguments attached to them, superficial logic, you know, issues, whether it be gun control or abortion or whatever it is. These are issues that are created by journalists. Now, the concept of justice under, underneath them is very important. But issues in politics are two completely different things. It is not politics as such. Politics, or the study of power and justice, is not issue-oriented journalism. It has no relation to power. In fact, issue-oriented debate is about entertainment. Media-generated issues are packaged in easy-to-understand verbiage. That has no relation to politics. It has no relation to government or reality. It is part of the entertainment industry. These exist to justify the present ruling class and give people the impression that they matter, but that they actually know anything. Um, CNN is to actual politics what Dr. Phil is to psychology. Um, MSNBC is to actual politics what Pink is to music. Any connection is purely coincidental. Issue-oriented thinking is an easy-to-grasp counterfeit. It's about clickbait. It's about attracting readers and listeners. Journalists create what we call politics and political issues. Those things are not politics. That is not justice. That is not how it's understood. These are prepackaged images that are called politics when it's put forward by CNN. Anyway, Florensky continues. He says, the basis of the state's internal policy is a fundamental ban on any political parties and organizations. Opposition parties impede the activity of the state, while parties that uh, are supportive of the state are not not just unnecessary, but they also decompose the state system, replacing the whole state, narrowing its scope, and ultimately becoming janissaries playing the uh, supreme state power. Reasonable state power does not require praetorians in the form of devotees who want to give directives to the authorities. Now, he's talking about political parties. He's referring to it in the same way George Washington referred to it. Parties are special interest organizations connected with wealthy families and powerful sectors of the economy. They're part of the issue-oriented entertainment industry. Capital rules both parties um, and the government that they, that they help control. And today, they're increasingly irrelevant. Parties aren't guilds or corporations because they express only one interest, and it's usually a hidden one. Parties provide no real service. They represent no one but capital and have no concern for excellence, standards, or even logic. Those institutions are images that the regime puts forward to justify their rule. But true corporations, they don't rule, but they serve. They don't dominate. They sacrifice themselves. From the very beginning, the Russian royalist program and royalists all over Europe Emphasized the need for the corporate system. Right in the, uh, in 1988, uh, I'm sorry, 1934, published in 1988. Brief summary of the program of the Russian Imperial Union. 1930s, almost all Russian emigres agreed on this concept. Um, Lazada's book, The Mission of the Russian Immigration, says this. Corporatism aims at the harmonious structuring of functions, not fragmenting it according to class or party. 
It connects different classes on the basis of their social function, not income. A corporation here means the union of people according to their function in the service of society. Corporations, labor, you know, woodworking, metal, uh, uh, education, agriculture, whatever. The corporation has not only the function of protecting the economic interests of a certain group of workers before the employer or the state, but also the joint function of harmonizing the social and economic life of both this industry and the whole country, right up to the legislative level, and should have its own chamber in the upper house of the legislature as Hegel prescribed. Now, as you know, I've been interpreting Hegel as a social nationalist for 25 years. Um, representation in the true sense isn't democratic. And it certainly is not the arithmetical addition of opinions. But it's a joint struggle for solutions. It's the, the exoteric meaning of the Russian subordinates. It's a consensus that's not merely the deliberation of a parliament, but the essence of a population over time. Before the rise of mass media and its corrupting influence, this was the true meaning of consensus. In corporate state, Overcoming class antagonism is part of the nature of social justice. And inequality is natural and inevitable, if freedom is respected. Serious socialism rejects the impossible equality, but corporatism seeks a managed or complex equality that ensures basic freedom, but unlike Western systems, rejects any inequality not based on personal qualities or labor. Inequality is justified only one way. That is, within a corporation someone who is who's simply better at the job than you are. And that better is defined internally by the best practices of the organization. So, to summarize this, the corporatist idea is that of a strong supreme power which recognizes and explicates the spiritual ideal of the people that's manifest by a corporate structure of society's five sectors, as we mentioned already, and their subdivisions. They preserve the integrity of the nation by keeping the moneyed oligarchy at bay and protecting the society from atomization. The ideal of the nation is manifest in the specific functions, those sectors, that any society needs to function. They're all equal in the social body, but of course internally, they're organized based on expert knowledge in the field. They're equal relative to each other, but they're hierarchic within each one. It arose in Europe precisely as a national defense against the omnipotence of financial conspirators who emerged victorious after the First World War. This is where corporatism really came from in its, in its 20th century guise. The financial oligarchy took over after World War I, and it, by its very structure, organizes itself as a conspiracy. It despises any public scrutiny. Italy, Spain, Portugal, Germany, all developed different variations of the corporate structure. But similar theoretical developments existed everywhere. Um, the Austrian corporatism of Chancellor Adolphus, for example, um, he proclaimed right in the Constitution the restoration of Christian social virtues and the struggle against the barbarism of the naturalistic and atheistic age, capitalist or communist, it makes no difference, he says. Um, Ilin uh, said in the 1930s, the great Russian nationalist theorist, he says, the state is not a mechanism of competing interests, but an organism of fraternal service. The unity of faith, honor, sacrifice, this is the historical and political basis of Russia. Russia began to move away from this and paid the price, but it will return to it again. Fascism did not give us a new idea, but only attempts to implement this Christian Russian national idea in relation to its present conditions. That's a better translation of what I what I said about. So corporatism, unlike most ideologies, is well defined and successful. It's been implemented under various, very different conditions. But it has four marks. In summary, first of all, it's structural. It brings together interest groups that actually represent the labor of people, and they're all socially important. It ensures their articulation socially. Second, it brings them into the decision-making process through both real and informal representation. Third, as we saw with Hegel, it has to do with psychology. It's about having people actually matter. It's meant to reach consensus in policy rather than to empower powerful but hidden elites that dominate parliamentary systems. And finally, it forces these interests to organize themselves in a national context. The corporation doesn't mean anything unless there is a unity of purpose for the society as a whole. Whether you call it corporatism or syndicalism, 
or even Guild Socialism. It's had all those names over the years. It is synonymous with social justice. It's a part of natural law because those five sectors that I've mentioned, and I mean, you can call them different names, you know, but those sectors all are absolutely essential for any society to function. And because of that, they're all equal relative to one another. Inequality exists within those sectors. I mean, there are some farmers who are better than others. There are some farmers who are more innovative than others. They deserve to be rewarded over and above those who are lazier or just not as skilled. Their inequality and hierarchy are completely ethically justified. Skilled labor, necessary labor of a society, needs to be organized this way, and that is the basis of representation. Hong Kong is a great example. All of these, all of these, everything from modern China, the Third Reich, in a very eccentric way, um, De Grill, you know, or, you know, described it in a very, um, not, not functional, but, but, uh, in a very different kind of way, but still the same ideas there. South Korea, um, Taiwan, Romania, uh, Spain, Portugal, and to some extent Italy, uh, all generally organized in this corporate way, but it's also part of the Middle Ages and the guild socialism that developed here. Socialism is a idealistic and spiritual Christian element. Unfortunately, the term has been hijacked by Marxists and Leninists who turned it into this horrible uh, dungeon of materialism and nominalism, but that's not truly what it is. Socialism is the rule of the social. Capitalism is the rule of capital. Um, but the rule of the social means the rule of the ideal nature of the population, the best that a population is, their role in the world. And this is what an ethnic group is. This is natural. This is normal. It's an extension of the family. And Hegel's theory of the matter is the correct one. And I think the philosophy of right is one of the greatest, if not the greatest, work of political philosophy uh, written in, in modern times. It's a way to bring both the classical and the medieval conception of social life into our age and make sense out of it. It's the only way out. Anyway, everybody, as always, I thank you for listening. I appreciate your support. We all don't agree on every little thing. That's normal. I change my mind all the time on things, so I don't even agree with me all the time. That's all right. I appreciate you guys listening. Thank you very much, and I will talk to you next time. Bye-bye.